For Sheriff Abigail Lane, life in Rockridge, Ohio, is cream cheese. Everyone keeps to themselves, and the last time the sleepy town needed serious policing, she hadn't even entered the academy yet. But when her boyfriend's son, Caleb Welsh, loses his head on County Road 10, her neat and orderly lifestyle is flipped wrong side up. All clues point to an animal attack, but what kind of animal has the ability to decapitate someone? One that is half human, of course. Even Lane's OCD won't help her in pursuing the worst threat Rockridge has ever seen in The Buck Stops Here, the new novella from Sean Seabock, available on Amazon on Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, and in paperback. All proceeds benefit the World Wildlife Fund. And there came a day, a day like no other, when the horror genre stood threatened by the forces of evil. On that day, the horror show with Brian Keene was born. Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Dave Thomas, Matt Wilderson, along with occasional co-hosts Kelly Owen, Phoebe, and Dungeon Master 77.1, these ambassadors of horror stand at the door bringing you the biggest names in the business, as well as tomorrow's superstars. Now, here they are, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. And welcome back once again, in fact, to The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Uh, I am, of course, Brian Keene. With me here, our last week on Skype, uh, sitting next to me, the lovely Mary San Giovanni. Hi there. And... Uh, Joining us on Skype, the equally lovely Matt Wilderson and Dave Thomas. Yo, hello. And <laughs> I, I do want to say uh, I'm I'm very happy that you said last week on Skype because uh, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does. I um, I, I, I have a, a way. How, how do you guys know that I'm going insane? I how? actually want to go grocery shopping. Oh no! Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I said the other day. To, to Phoebe, I was like, I kind of want to go to the grocery store because I have not left the house <laughs> since February. <laughs> so, oh man, that yeah. is bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, good. <laughs> we, uh, we thought about it and worked very hard. And I even talked to an actual medical professional and got his opinion. Um, and you know, uh, Dr. Scholes doesn't count, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Pepper. <laughs> yeah, Dr. You know, Pepper doesn't know what he's doing either. Dr. You know Vodka. What I, you, know what I, you know what I love? I love that we've been recording for exactly one minute and 56 seconds, and we have already heard more from Dave and Matt in those two minutes than we've heard <laughs> from them in the last six episodes. <laughs> and I'm sorry. Got, I'll, I'll be quiet then. No, it, it's, I, I like hearing from you. It's got to be because Kelly's not on with us this week, right? I, I was maybe it's a, because I can't. Maybe it's because I can't see anybody either. Uh, well, I, I was going to say I was going to make a white. I have my whiteboard that I use, and I was literally going to the other week uh, write write on it so I could hold it up to the camera. And says, "Can I talk now?" Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we we should thank Kelly, of course, uh, for for filling in for you, Dave, while you're yes. in the hospital, yes. and then yeah. stick, sticking around with us as yeah. well. Um, but yeah, we. Uh, We've talked about it, and we've come up with a safe way to record here in studio. Um, Matt, we we had you and your lovely wife here over the weekend, and uh, you guys got to see it. And and you concur. The space is big enough. Um, If we limit it strictly to the four of us and occasionally Dungeon Master 77.1 and – you know, it's it's well ventilated. Uh, you know, we can't have any guests because, of course, we can't account for where those guests have been. Those guests may say, oh, I'm being safe. I am practicing social distancing. I've been isolated. But we just we can't quantify that statement. Um, right. So right. We'll, we'll continue to do guest interviews over Skype, unfortunately. Uh, but the four of us for the for the meat of the show. <laughs> Actually, no, I guess the interview would be the meat. We're the, the for the appetizer yeah. and the yes. dessert of the show. <laughs> we're the lettuce and tomatoes. Yeah, we're like the condiments of the show. Uh-huh. We're the, we're the amuse-bouche of the show. 
Well, that makes it sound fancy. It does. I'm there not even go. sure what that means. Maybe we could be tapas. I don't know what that is either. <laughs> we're each our own little bowl of deliciousness. Yeah, tapas is basically small plates. It's a Spanish thing. It's also <laughs> also known as the greatest way to eat ever. Yeah. I, I wish the people at home could see the way Brian is looking at me right now. <laughs> I wish I could see it. Yeah. <laughs> Skype's being a bastard today. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of bastards, uh, later in the show, uh, second half of the show, we have finally joining us. We've been wanting to have him on for two years. Uh, thanks to the pandemic, we've been able to make that happen. Uh, Max Booth is going to join us. He's going to talk about his not one, but two brand new releases. Um, he's also going to talk about this the Cinestate thing uh if you listen to last week's episode you'll know what i'm referring to um because you know he's caught up in all that as well uh so he's going to give us his thoughts and his opinions uh but before we do that we have the news and before we do the news i just want to remind people again about philip fricassi's horror writers for black lives matter uh this is a fundraiser he is doing on behalf of the naacp legal defense and educational fund the donations are 100% tax deductible. So if you donate five bucks, that's five bucks you can claim on your taxes. Um, it's taking place on GoFundMe. It's well over. The initial goal was $5,000. Uh, it's well over $20,000 wow. at this point for a very good cause. Uh, you nice. know, of course, you know, yes, horror writers and their fans believe that Black Lives Matter. Uh, if you don't believe that, I'm not sure why you're listening to this show. Unless you're, I don't know, Kevin Strange and you're hate listening. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we thank you for that, Kevin, because your hate boner does write checks. It helps me pay Matt every month. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, we got we got some big advertisers coming in here to the network soon so that we can we can start paying Dave again. And uh, it's all thanks to Kevin Strange's racist hate boner. <laughs> Gonna be in the, uh, in the in the show description. Or is that going to demonetize us? No. Well, YouTube's going to demonetize us anyway because we yeah. are, in fact, going to follow up on the Sin Estate thing because there's there's more nonsense afoot. Um, but before we Thanks. do that, I I want to talk about Denny O'Neill and Dave, Matt. I'm sure you want to talk about Denny O'Neill as well. Uh, Mary, you're not a comic person, but I know who he is. You know who he is because he wrote the quintessential Batman. Yes. Everything that Batman is to me. He wrote my childhood Batman. Aww. And and those Christopher Nolan movies mm -hmm. would not have had the tone or the success that they had had without Denny O'Neill. Um Aww. Yeah, he was a, you know, just a legend as far as as comic book writers go. He he was also a novelist and a short story writer and a screenwriter, but he's best known for comics. Uh he died last Thursday when last week's episode aired. Uh, he was 81 years old and much like Jack Kirby was a badass. You know, he, he born in 1939 and he got into comic books at a very young age, you know, reading all the golden age stuff, um, graduated from St. Louis University, joined the Navy and immediately was part of the blockade during the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> well, that's how you want to start off. Well, wow. you know, you know I, I was reading about that. And it's it's funny, um, you know. I joined the Navy, and immediately out of boot camp, I got sent to Cuba to uh, to Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, of course, we didn't have the the Cuban Missile Crisis going on then, and you know, I got to do things like cliff dive and stuff, and it was very cool. But but yeah, he you know he was a he was he was a badass through and through. Um, he started at Marvel. Uh, he did, you know, this was when Marvel was starting to expand and Stan Lee just couldn't write everything anymore. Um, or he couldn't take credit for things that Kirby and Ditko were writing. Uh, <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah. For our new listeners, I'm not saying Stan Lee didn't write anything. I'm just saying he got credit for writing a lot more than he did. Okay. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, Lee couldn't keep up and they brought in Roy Thomas, of course. And uh, Denny O'Neill was someone else that they brought in. He did, uh, I think, six issues of uh, Strange Tales and he, 
he did dialogue for Rawhide Kid and Millie the Model and uh, the final 13 pages of Daredevil 18. Um, but soon after that, uh, oh, and uh, I, I should point out X-Men 65. Uh, that's notable, not only because they brought back Professor X, but because it was his first collaboration with Neil Adams. And we'll get back to why that's important in a minute, Mary. Okay. Because uh, I feel like I'm explaining this to you. I don't mean that in a sexist way. No, no, no. Just, I get it. You're not a comic I, just, I didn't know he worked for Marvel and DC. Oh, yes. I, I feel like that's a fairly, and maybe I'm wrong, but a fairly rare occurrence um, no, like either you no. work see or you work for Marvel. Well, n- these days, perhaps there's like a non compete. These days, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, back in the day, like everybody kind of switched teams. Yeah, yeah. Like it, oh, okay. you know, once once you got pissed off at your editor at one, you just went to the other. Yeah, one. you wa- you literally walked down the block to the other one. Kind of like what you do. <laughs> kind of like what I do now. <laughs> It's almost as if I grew up reading these guys and watching how they conducted their career. And, um, so, yeah, he, he moved to Charlton Comics um, and uh, he did some stuff there under a pseudonym, Sergius O'Shaughnessy. Uh, and when his, when, it, when his editor at Charlton got hired by D.C., uh, the editor brought him along with him um, and D.C., was where he rose to fame. You know, he did early stuff like Wonder Woman and Justice League. Uh, but then he did Green Lantern, Green Arrow. Now, Dave, I was a little too young to read that issue, but I'm sure you read that back in the day. I did. I've not looked at it in many, many years, but yes, I, I did. Yeah. yeah. Now, this was important, Mary, because, well, first of all, he took Green Arrow, who was sort of this this cheesy Robin Hood, mm-hmm. Bruce wayne light. Okay. And O'Neill strips him of his wealth, of his playboy status, makes him what they called at the time an urban hero. What that meant, it was code word for a socialist. They made <laughs> they made Green Arrow a superhero, a fucking socialist. Oh. Um, and got away with it. Okay. And then they teamed him up with Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, who I don't know that they ever – came out and said he was a conservative, but he was certainly more conservative than his partner. Right. Okay. And they, you know, for those millennials, and, and I don't say that as a slur, but, you know, the comicscape movement is mostly millennials. For, for, for those who say, oh, keep politics out of our comics. Well, we'd have to go all the way back to here. Yeah. Because Denny O'Neill infused Green Lantern, Green Arrow, with social commentary and politics leading up to an infamous story in which Green Arrow's young ward, Speedy, uh, gets addicted to heroin. Oh, no. And that was unheard of Yeah, back then. Dave, do you do you remember reading that, like, off the stand? Like, you bought it and read it off the stand? No, I read it l- later. Um, number one, I you know, I, I talk about my childhood a little bit. We, you know, I, I don't like to talk about growing up, but it was pretty terrible and we had no money. So comics are actually a pretty rare purchase for me as a kid. Like, yeah. you know, so you had to rely on like a year. friends and stuff. Uh, I had no friends, but um, kind of like now, but anyway, um, no, I, I, I caught up to it. I would say college. Yeah. You know, when I started collecting comics, that's when I caught up. Like I knew about it, you know, uh, from, from like the letters pages in comics where people would discuss all sorts of topics and, and early f- fanzine type things. But I, I think that I didn't see that probably until I was in college when I, you know, could buy back issues and, you know, I had some money cause I had a, like a part-time job and stuff while I was going to school. Um, so that I caught up with it later. I don't know if, if me at age, I'm just going to pick an age. I don't remember what, what exactly you're coming at. Like age 12. I don't know if I would have gotten it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I think a lot of it probably would have gone over my head. Um, so it's probably better if you read it more as an adult. So, I think that's apt. You know, Chris yeah. Golden and I have talked on Defenders Dialogue. There's some some drug usage stories that Steve Gerber did. And, uh, you know, I, reading them as we did at like age nine, ten, like we understood the character was on drugs, but the the import of it kind of went right over our heads. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, th- this this Green Lantern, Green Arrow story, it. You know, at the time, the only comic book professional that ever made the news was Stan Lee. And suddenly, Denny O'Neill is in the New York Times, and he's getting invited to do all the morning talk shows. And um, 
you know, he, he said uh, in an interview later, he, he said, uh, you know, that all that notoriety, all that sudden fame, he says, quote, it messed my head up pretty thoroughly for a couple of years, deteriorating mad marriage, bad habits, deteriorating relationships with human beings, with anything that wasn't a typewriter. In fact, it was a bad few years there. End quote. I feel that quote so hard. I can't even tell you. Um, and I know a lot of other writers and I'm, I'm, we're not going to name names here in the air, but I know that quote spoke to a lot of them as well. Um, but of course, Mary, as, as we said, he and Neil Adams, uh, their 1970s Batman introduces Raz al Ghul, Talia mm-hmm. al Ghul, um, brings back Two Face, uh, and perhaps most importantly, brings back the actual friggin' Joker, who had kind of become, pardon the pun, a joke. Um, and they, they brought him back as just, you know, a homicidal maniac who murders people on right. a whim and, you know, delights in mayhem. Um, you know, those were the Batmans that I read as a kid. Obviously, I imprinted on those. You uh, think? <laughs> you know, Matt, I mean, you were you were too young to read those, but you've seen that mythology played out over the decades from all the other writers that just build on what Denny O'Neill did. Right. You know? Um, so yeah, like I said, he also wrote, you know, half a dozen novels over a dozen novellas and short stories. Um, like comic book related books or completely both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. In what genre? Uh, he did like a lot of pulp stuff. He was, he was a big pulp fan. Yeah. You know, um, He's survived by his son, writer and director and producer, Lawrence O'Neill. Um, just a huge, huge loss for our industry. Yeah, our absolutely. Out to yeah. The That's very sad. You got you got to let Dave and Matt talk because they haven't had a chance to talk in weeks. I did, I did. <laughs> <laughs> <Jeez. laughs> uh, I mean, like, like you said, um, if it wasn't for his work that he did with Batman and bringing back the Joker the way he was and everything, uh, probably wouldn't have the movies that we had right now. Exactly. When when Nolan did it, and I might put, not have been old put enough those to scissors appreciate. down, Mary. Put those scissors down, Mary. Help! Help! <laughs> I pushed her too. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Matt. No, it's fine. I'm pulling a Kelly on you. <laughs> Oh my God. Back to my office. <sighs> Go ahead, Matt. Uh, no, 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 I, I pretty much got my point out. That's fine. <laughs> there, now there's scissors being brought into stuff. I, <laughs> I think I'm just going to stay on Skype. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, what about you? Anything to add? Uh, no, I, I mean, like you said, and I, you know, I, I think, I don't know. Are, are these collected anywhere? Like a, easy to get hold of collection or something. Oh, I'm sure they are. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So I, I, I think we've a lot of listeners that probably didn't read these, you know, cause they're in the seventies. So you, uh, I, I think you should go pick these up. Um, the other thing I think too is, you know, obviously he's a great writer, but I think that the combination of him and Neil Adams artwork, you know, that's what really to me, because it was just different from everything else people have been doing previously. Cause like, I wasn't much of a Batman fan until Denny O'Neill. Right. Yeah. I like, you know, I read Batman and, and stuff, but uh, I was more of a Marvel person, but uh, I, I remember again, you know, as I, I back issues, you know, as I, as I had money and I, I got into those and I'm like, these are just so much better, you know? And um, so, yeah, that's a huge loss, huge. And like you said, you know, Nolan's films wouldn't exist without him. Absolutely. Right. No way. Yeah. They're just so influential. Right. So. All right. So. I have a question for you guys. Who's the who's the douchebag that did Jeepers Creepers? What's his name? Oh, God. oh um, um, hold on. It'll come to me in a minute. Um, Victor Salva. Yes. Victor Salva. Salva. All right. Yeah. Matt, you had a, a great idea last week. We were talking about how every time there's a story in our industry about sexual harassment or sexual assault, if we report on it, YouTube demonetizes us because those yes. buzzwords automatically get flagged. So what what's his name again? Victor Salva. Salva. So we're going to we're going to call those things pulling a Victor Salva. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll still get demonetized. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Well, last week, if you listen to last week's episode, uh, we spent a good 45 minutes talking about uh, horror movie producer Adam Donahue pulling a Victor Salva repeatedly. Yeah. Um, up to and including his arrest this past April uh, for sexual assault of a minor uh, and the fact that he is currently free on bail and awaiting trial. We also talked about how Cinestate, who've done films like Bone Tomahawk, Brawl in Cell Block 99, Dragged Across, Across Concrete, VFW, Satanic Panic, etc., uh, continued to work with Donahue. Allegedly, after having all these allegations made clear to them, um, we talked about how Cinestate's Dallas Sonier uh, responded to this by saying, quote, we're under siege right now. Everyone involved has their own personal vendettas against us. They have a history of harassing us and having problems with us. It feels like a targeted hit and it feels like an attack. I think people have real issues with us. They have issues with our success, the amount of movies we've made, and in a short time built this company to be something very special. It feels partisan, end quote. Uh, Sonia, of course, referring to the fact that, you know, he's uh, a Republican, I suppose, votes. I don't know if he's registered Republican, but he said in quotes that, you know, he he tends to, to side with those ideals and values politically. And he's also specifically said he's making movies for, you know, Trump voters. Um, and, and he didn't really seem to understand that uh, people don't have issues with their success or the amount of movies they've made or their political stance. They, they had issues with the fact that they hired an allegedly known sexual predator mm. uh to continue to work on them, their movies and put him in charge of people and then put him in charge of people's paychecks. Uh, now, we told you last week that there was more to this story that we'd be getting into this week. And this week, we're going to get into that. And that is our beloved Fangoria. Uh, now, disclaimer, I have been appearing in the pages of Fangoria pretty much since my career started. Uh, it was uh, their review of The Rising that helped my first novel become a bestseller. Uh, and they have featured me regularly in their pages ever since. Uh, so has Rue Morgue. I'm so grateful to both of them. Uh, but Fangoria is owned by Cinestate. Um, and they uh, issued this public statement. Uh, they, unfortunately, we had already recorded last week's issue or last week's episode before this was issued. Uh, so we're going to we're going to talk about it this week. They said, quote, we at Birth Movies Death and Fangoria are troubled and angered by the recent Daily Beast report citing Cinestate's unsafe, toxic film sets. After the article's publication, Cinestate CEO Dallas Sonier encouraged us to publicly speak our minds on the subject, a necessary first step of many overdue steps towards transparency, transparency. With that in mind. It is beyond past the time for corporate negligence and protection of predators at the expense of the women they work with. It hurts us to know that women were jeopardized and silenced by the company we work for. And we recognize that birth movies, death and Fangoria's own writers could potentially have been put at risk by the same secrecy and disregard for safety. That hypothetical in and of itself creates an untenable relationship between Cinestate and our respective families. Uh, all of this is unacceptable. We're not interested in distancing ourselves from this problem. Change doesn't happen when you leave the table and hope for the best. Change happens when you fight for it. The fact is we all have experienced dealing with precisely this sort of thing, and we're prepared to help affect change again. Indeed, if we are to continue to work at our respective brands, we insist upon it. As such, we are calling upon the leadership of Cinestate and in particular Sonia and producer Amanda Presmick to formulate and publicly release an action plan explaining precisely how they will prevent this sort of behavior from occurring on their film sets or in any area of their company going forward. Further. We're calling upon Cinestate to roll out mandatory sexual harassment training for all of its employees. 
everyone at corporate, everyone at the entities owned by Cinestate, everyone who goes to work on a Cinestate set, everyone. Um, they go on to call for a substantial donation be made to an organization like the Dallas Area Rape Crisis Center. Uh, they go on to call for Cinestate to editorially separate from Fangoria in a real and significant way. Uh, hey, you know, uh, Brian, they, they can point, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, can I pause you for a second? And, and this is a little behind the scenes now for everybody. I just need to ask you, uh, can you hear the trucks outside my house uh, grinding up trees? We cannot. No, okay, care. good. Just wanted to make sure. Because, <laughs> of course, of all times when we record anything, there has to be something going on outside. <laughs> it wouldn't be the horror show if there wasn't. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just wanted to make sure if you guys could hear it or not. All Matt, right, please continue. Can you ever go back and listen to our really early episodes, like the first season, the first year on the air? Oh, I have. I, I've heard, like, the, the cars just flying up and down the road. And yeah. <laughs> have you ever heard the meth heads who used to crash the show? I have not gotten to one of those episodes. Yet. <laughs> I, I lived at the time I lived in an apartment complex and uh, the people next door to me, it was a bunch of young 20 somethings and they were all on meth. And, you know, Dave and I would record in the kitchen every week and we'd have the windows open and Dave will tell you, they, they would stop. It was like the today show yeah. for crackheads. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> they they'd come by the window. They'd sit out their lawn chairs and listen while Dave and I held court. And you know, then they started getting brave and like wanted to be on the show. So they they say things through the screen. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you had a live studio audience. The it's I, like the, you I, had a drive through for meth heads on the show. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the best, and I don't remember what episode number it was, but I, I remember it was it was Dave and Coop and I. So it was early early on, probably within the first 20 episodes. And uh, one of them knocks on the door while we're recording and wants to know if, if he can borrow a bucket of water so they can flush their toilet. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Dave reaches for the pause button. I'm like, no, no, no. We're, we're staying live. <laughs> Leave this in. It's gold. And it became like for that first year. Of course, we've been on the year six years uh, approaching seven at the end of this year yeah. uh but you know it, it it became like one of the the best ofs for that first <laughs> year <laughs> awesome so uh, any, uh yeah, please continue you know um how did Cinestate respond to this well we don't know exactly uh but fangoria has since released a new statement uh, in this second statement, they say, quote, in discussions with Cinestate, we've been encouraged so far by what we believe is a genuine desire to improve conditions for women on sets, to donate funds to important organizations like Rain, and to do their part to help make the industry safer for everyone. Our priority is real results and demonstrable progress. Change is the goal, and we believe it should be encouraged and supported when undertaken. That said, since releasing our initial statement, we have come to understand and respect that Fangoria and Birth Movies Death cannot continue under the Cinestate banner. It is our understanding that new buyers are being sought for both brands. End quote. Yeah. Wow. Now, I I had. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was I had read a little something about that like a week ago about how. Uh, Fangoria is up for sale essentially right now. Right. I know people on Twitter were saying that Josh Malaman and I should buy it. <laughs> you know, I can't speak for Josh, but I don't, I don't have money to buy Fangoria. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, turn in a couple of bottles and uh, the recycling center, you're, you're set. Yeah. yeah I mean, you know, if, if I did, I, 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 you know, I would, I would of course keep Phil and Meredith on board because uh, I think they're doing a great job, but, I, I would have to bring in Mike Lombardo to do something for the magazine. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know? And then it's just there, there'd be a whole new controversy with that. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, there's no way that would go wrong. I should never feel safe again. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, either either one of you interested in buying Fangoria, Dave, Matt? Um, yeah, with my vast 
uh, a state here that I have, you know, that'll be no problem. Um, I, well, I mean, know. how much can it possibly be? I mean, I mean, you know, look, <laughs> when, it, when it comes to horror now, I'm not talking about, you know, movie properties or, or intellectual property like that. I'm talking about actual brands. When it comes to horror, is there more a more iconic brand than Fangoria? No, no. I mean, maybe Hammer Films, but I would say Fangoria resonates more with today's audience. Oh, I think more people yeah. would know what Fangoria is than Hammer Studios. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, Hammer is like a R H type thing. But um, Hammer's putting out new movies. I heard. I'm yeah, very- they've been for the past five years now. <laughs> Else on the show. No, I was trying. To, I was just trying to let you know, like, hey, you might have missed some if you wanted to watch some new Hammer movies. Uh, you like um, Horns? You remember that one, Mary? The one Horns? based off of uh, Hill's book. Oh, right, 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 right. That yeah. was done by Hammer Studios. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't yes. know that. Yeah. Oh, good to know. I'm not saying anything because I've noticed the scissors are not without. Reach. <laughs> they're, they're, within, they're within reaching distance. So, and so is the crazy glow. Well, if you're if you're gonna buy Fangoria, there's a couple things to be aware of. Um, Rob Galuzzo, uh, who was of course the director of acquisitions and distribution at Fangoria, what that means is he handpicked titles that would be associated with the brand. Yes. Um, he tweeted his resignation from Fangoria. Mm-hmm. Really? Okay. But wait, there's more. Uh, when he tweeted his resignation, uh, Jordan and Mary, uh, tell me how to pronounce this because this you're Italian and Cruciola. Cruciola. Did I do that right? Yeah, that's good. Because I my hillbilly ass would have said, I don't even know what I Cruciola. <laughs> so oh, what? Cruciola. Cruciola. Okay. <laughs> Jordan Cruciola. Uh, she's the associate editor in Los Angeles for Vulture. Uh, in responding to Galuzzo's resignation, she tweeted, quote, when the Cinestate story broke, Rob tweeted about how he needed to process everything. He was broken up. Now he is positioning himself as acting on conscience to leave the company behind. But Rob Galuzzo has been harassing women for years. And while I was not going to say anything because the stories are not my own, His performance of empathy, which is deeply insulting to the friends of mine he has harassed, was too much of an open taunt to keep not saying that Rob Galuzzo harassed women. End quote. Uh, Galuzzo then responded via social media, quote, to say I was blindsided by Jordan's accusations yesterday is an understatement, and I initially reacted by completely shutting down literally and figuratively. What he's referring to there is he shut down all his social media, but he then reactivated it. He goes on to say several years back before I was employed by any film company, it is true. I have asked out several women within the horror scene. And while, yes, I was awkward, immature and inexperienced, I thought that in no I had thought that in no way I had ever knowingly hurt, harassed or crossed any lines. But I really took the time to read Jordan's posts word for word. And I've thought back to every one of my experiences going back to 2009. There are instances where I definitely can now see that my passive aggressive behavior could have hurt people. And it pains me greatly now because I chose not to see it. I know nothing I can say in one personal statement can possibly repair any of this, but I genuinely and sincerely want to take the necessary steps to make it right. No matter how long it takes, uh, He then goes on to apologize to any woman who may have felt uncomfortable around him for any reason. Um, He says at the end, he says uh, that he's going to listen and that, quote, I cannot control what people want to believe or choose to say on the Internet, but I can control what I do going forward to all the many people in the car community who have reached out and supported me with love and kindness. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And quote. But wait, more. Because <laughs> um, there's now an exodus from Cinestate related properties such as Fangoria. Uh, even the, the not-so-woke Joe Bob Briggs 
And I, I, I say that not to be insulting. I, I know Joe Bob. He's a, you know, he's a nice guy, but he's your, he's, he's your uncle, you know? Yeah. He's an older guy. He's not always going to use language that, that may be acceptable these days. Okay. Uh, but he says, even he says, <laughs> based, on the, based on the revelations at Cinestate and their failure to come clean about everything and make it right, I guess I have to resign from both Fangoria and Rebeller. Sad on several levels, including the end of Fangori, Fangori, Fango's miracle comeback and the decline of a Texas-based film company, end quote. Um. Yeah, I would have probably worded it differently. It, I mean, you, you can't read tone and inflection on line, but it does sound like, well, I guess I have to resign. Yeah. I don't understand. Yeah. Maybe this is a stupid question and I missed something somewhere, but if Fangoria is being sold and has made very clear that they do not agree with uh, what happened with Sinestate and that they are staunchly against it and proactive in looking for change, why are people leaving Fangoria? Is it because of that uncertainty well, who's going to buy them? Or? It's because Sinestate really hasn't said much publicly. Um. In fact, I looked and I looked. The only statement I've seen was the one that Phil and Meredith posted from Fangoria about what Cinestate's doing behind the scenes. But I, I've yet to see anything from Cinestate mm. um, other than that quote to the Daily Beast about how this all feels very partisan. Right. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, bottom line, it, it all boils down to optics, essentially, for most people. Yeah. And, and bottom line, if you're. If you're working for one, then you're making money for the other. Yep. It's the bottom yeah. line. No, the I'm other thing, the too, is, you know, it's for sale, but that doesn't mean anybody's going to buy it. Yeah. Especially, gotcha. especially right now with what's going on in the world. Uh, yeah. It could be a long time until they sell it to somebody else. Yeah. And, we, and we get into that from some other people. Mick Garris uh, said is, it is with deep regret that under the uncomfortable circumstances surrounding the state of affairs at Cinestate, we, the undersigned podcasters, have decided together that we can no longer continue to operate under the Fangoria Podcast Network. Uh, and, you know, that uh, not only was it was it Mick's postmortem podcast, that also included Nightmare University, The Movie Crypt, Nightmare on Film Street, and Casualty Friday. Um, oh, wow. you know, Mick, I've been told you listen to The Horror Show. I, I've never actually asked you if you listen to The Horror Show. <laughs> I'm just going to say, you know, Brian Keene Radio Network, be glad to have you. Um, hell, we could even pay you. I could just stop paying Matt and we could pay you instead. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that seems fair. <laughs> um, freelance. <clears throat> my, oh, oh, we've woken Matt. Go ahead. <laughs> good, thing, good thing Matt's not near the scissors. <laughs> uh. No. Nothing. <laughs> well, what, what, what do you want me? Yeah, sure. Give my money away. I don't care. <laughs> I'll just work for insults like I usually like I used to. Yeah. Well, you're hey, on you know, the right um, work for that. You know, if, if you don't have money and you're going to need somewhere to live, Mary's not currently occupying that spider infested porta potty that Brian's going to let her stay in. That's so true. you know, That's there's true. a vacancy. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Matt, you were here over the weekend. You saw the RV parked in the driveway. You could live in that. <laughs> Thank you. You're very gracious. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know how you ever have enemies. You are just such. I, <laughs> oh, shit. All right. Uh, freelance writer Molly Henry says uh, she says, quote, I will no longer be writing for Fangoria. I can't in good conscience write for, <clears throat> excuse me, a company owned by Cinestate and know my checks are coming from Sonye. No matter what, advocating for victims of sexual harassment and assault will always be more important to me than working for an organization that does the opposite. And that right there, Mary, I think sums up your question. The yes. answer to your question. Yes. Um, I just I, I feel for Fangoria because I feel that Fangoria as a separate entity is caught in the middle here. Um, but I understand what you're saying. I, I absolutely agree. I you know, Phil is a great dude. Uh I don't know Meredith, but I know of Meredith and mm -hmm. I know people who know Meredith, and she sounds like a great person as well. Mm -hmm. Um 
And, you know, I know a lot of freelancers who write for Fangoria. Um, it sucks. Yeah. It just sucks. It, it does. It, it, I think if Cinestate had addressed this in a more proactive way earlier on, they wouldn't have this kind of exodus, perhaps. Or, you know, instead of complaining about how people are out to get them, maybe, you know, take a moment and consider the victims. In this in this situation, the women who came forward and, and the women who didn't come forward. Um, but, you know, even Fright Rags released a statement. And, and I don't say that in a, in a derogatory way against Fright Rags. But, you know, Fright Rags, of course, the apparel company for the horror genre. Yep. I don't ever remember them making a statement like this before. I, I was it really caught my attention. I was <laughs> I was impressed. Uh Fright Rags uh, said, I stand with Fangoria. We will not be renewing our license to sell their merchandise when it expires at the end of this month as our royalties are paid to their parent company, Cinestate. Gotcha. The exception will be any leftover Fangoria pride shirts as all of the profits for those go to charity, end quote. Aww. So that's the state of the genre. Now, in a moment. We're going to break for an ad, and then we're going to come back with Max Booth. But before we do that, there's another story <laughs> that's not related to Cinestate Fangoria, but coverage of it has spun out of Cinestate Fangoria. And that is a story involving the Solska sisters. Now, we are recording this on Tuesday the 16th. I do not have all the facts in that story yet. And therefore I am not comfortable reporting it. I think it would be very irresponsible to do so. Uh, but I do know that the Soska sisters attorneys have apparently been reaching out to some of the principals involved on social media. So I just want to give the attorneys a head up. We are going to be reporting on this next week. So, you know, um, Easy to contact us. Just go to briankeen.com, click podcast slash radio, and all the contact information is right there. Um, but yes, we will be reporting on the Soska Sisters story next week. Um, so yeah, let's take a moment, hear from our sponsor, and then we'll come back with Max Booth, and then we'll catch you folks on the flip side. For Sheriff Abigail Lane, life in Rockridge, Ohio, is cream cheese. Everyone keeps to themselves, and the last time the sleepy town needed serious policing, she hadn't even entered the academy yet. But when her boyfriend's son, Caleb Welsh, loses his head on County Road 10, her neat and orderly lifestyle is flipped wrong side up. All clues point to an animal attack, but what kind of animal has the ability to decapitate someone? One that is half human, of course. Even Lane's OCD won't help her in pursuing the worst threat Rockridge has ever seen in The Buck Stops Here, the new novella from Sean Seabock, available at Amazon on Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, and in paperback. All proceeds benefit the World Wildlife Fund. Okay, joining me now is a Texas-based author, editor, publisher, and podcaster, uh, some say he's the Brian Keene of his generation. He's the editor-in-chief of Perpetual Motion Machine Publishing, the managing editor of Dark Moon Digest, and the host of not one, but two podcasts, Ghoulish, which I've been a guest on, and Castle Rock Radio, which I listen to frequently. Uh, in addition to contributing to Lit Reactor, Fangoria, Crime Reads, and elsewhere, his many books include the Splatterpunk Award-nominated Carnivorous Lunar Activities, how to Successfully Kidnap Strangers, Toxicity, and the just-released Touch the Night, and We Need to Do Something. I am, of course, talking about Max Booth the Third. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Who the hell is calling me the Brian Keen of my generation? Give well, I'm names. calling, I'm oh, calling okay. that. But, yeah, you know about the important <laughs> though. <laughs> I'm going to use that as a, uh, a quote at some place. The Brian Keen of his generation. Brian Keen. <laughs> well, I mean, you could you could be the an argument could be made that you're the the Carlton Mellick of your generation. I mean, you do use the third. You're not Max Booth, but Max Booth the third, much yeah. as Carlton has always been Carlton Mellick the third. I got a bone to pick with that guy. Recently, his book stopped using the suffix 
makes me look bad. You know, I've noticed that too. And I, uh, I've known Carlton for, oh gosh, going on 20 years, I guess at this point. And, uh, I, I've wanted to ask him, and I have not asked him in private. But now you and I are talking about it publicly. So, and I know Carlton listens to the show. So, so Carl, this is your chance. You need to step up and, and tell the public what's up with that. It's confusing. I don't know. <laughs> it is. Um, so, Max, with you, I know that you've said in previous interviews that you always wanted to be a writer. There was never really an you know an aha moment for you. So were you writing as a child, like as far back as you can remember, or were you engaging in some form of storytelling? The uh, the whole writing stuff began, I would say, around age seven or eight. Yeah. When my, uh, my dog, Penny, uh, a type of rat, mutt, I don't know what type of dog I would call that thing, but she was a, she was a dog, supposedly. <laughs> she, uh, she died, and I was pretty uh, fucked up about it, and. And I began writing these little uh, eventuals of myself and the dog going on these uh, these treks into the woods and just like fighting crime. And that's really when the uh, the writing began going. Wow. Do you still have those? No, I do not. I have a I have nothing from my childhood. Yeah. Well, I know. uh I mean, you grew up in in northern Indiana, I think. Um, yes. And I've heard you say before, and, and I never knew if you were joking or if you were serious, but I, I've heard you say that you lived in a hotel for most of your teenage years. Yeah, when I was uh, in my when I was twelve, going on thirteen, we uh, we lost the house due to uh, gambling issues. And we moved into various hotels and just lived in hotel rooms for, until I was about 16. I uh, dropped out of school and just hung out in a hotel room reading and writing for like fucking three and a half years. Wow. Uh, we never went back to the house. So I never uh, I lost it. We lost everything that we owned. Yeah. So, so, and so all your childhood stuff was gone in the process as well, though. Right, yeah, I don't have uh, anything from that. I had uh, so many comic books, too. Uh, lots of uh, movies and video games. All that stuff is gone. Wow. Wow. But you kept reading and writing, even in that situation. So really, you were you were like responsible for keeping up your own education, then. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, they pulled me out of school because it was uh, too difficult for my dad to drive me to the school and pick me up uh after his job so they just took me out and said yeah we're gonna homeschool him which did not happen at all so i mean most of my uh, education just comes from reading books and just spending a lot of time online yeah wow so well i mean anyone who's read your stuff i the first time i read you you know i i could see that Joe R. Lansdale had had an influence on you as a writer. And I, I think because he's influenced so many of us, we can, we can spot it in other writers. Um, did you discover him around that age or did you discover him later on? No, I didn't discover him until I moved to Texas. Yeah. And I, uh, I moved to Texas when I was 18 and, uh, I just, I found out this guy lived in Texas as well. And I'm trying to recall the book that I got introduced to. It was his best of Joe Lansdale collection. I went to some oh, convention. Yeah. I went to some convention and saw him and I, I didn't know who he was. I was like, hey, this book looks cool. Can I buy it? He said, yeah. Well, he said it in his awesome Texas accent that I'm not going <laughs> to try to copy because he might karate chop me in the throat. <laughs> Yeah, and I was hooked ever since, and I uh, discovered, holy shit, this is a guy who wrote Bubba Hotep. I love that movie. Yeah. But did you find, because by then, I mean, obviously, you're already developing as a writer. And then you read Lansdale the first time. And by the way, kudos, you picked a great book to start with. Uh, that best of short story collection is just, it's a it's a fantastic Lansdale primer. But did you find then that, you were changing how you approached writing and how you approached narrative voice. It, was that, was that sort of your aha moment then? Yes, because what Joe Lansdale's writing taught me is 
stop being so focused on, on what genre I want to write and just create my own genre. Because, I mean, if you listen to any interview Joe Lansdale does, if the topic of genre comes up, he goes, I only write in the Joe Lansdale genre. And that was right. really eye-opening to me. No, well, it's true. I mean, you know, he's he's renowned as, as a horror writer. Uh, and, you know, if you look at Joe's bibliography, I mean, sure, he wrote a lot of horror back in the day. I mean, he was one of the splatterpunks, one of the OG splatterpunks, but, but the vast majority of his bibliography is not horror fiction. Um, you know, he, he is very much a genre unto himself. Uh, he was writing bizarro before it was called bizarro. Uh, you know, he's done crime, he's done Westerns, he, he's done, you know, historical fiction, a little bit of everything, but all of it, you know, much like Elmore Leonard or Carlton, who we just talked about, it, all of it is is unique unto himself. And I find that same thing in your stuff as well. Oh, thank you. I, you know, a uh, little known fact with Joe Lansdale fans back in the day when he used to write only a uh, splattle punk, he used to go by the name Joey Splat. <laughs> <laughs> And there's the Max <laughs> booth that I knew we were going to get on the show soon. <laughs> I'm going to have him on a ghoulish soon, and I, um, I'm terrified of in- introducing him as Joey Splat. I don't know if he would uh, hit me or not. He won't hit you. I Look, Joe <laughs> and I, we're tight. I can tell. You know, don't hit the kid. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I got to ask, and it's it's – we're, we're we're already going sideways with this interview, but uh, you know, one of the podcasts you do is ghoulish. Yes, and you know, it's 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 a it's a comedic podcast. I mean, you're a funny guy naturally, but you know, ghoulish is it's intended to be funny. Um, you had me on the very first episode, and the bit between you and I was, and I played along with it was that I thought it was going to be a podcast dedicated to my novel Ghoul, but to this day, I mean, it, it, I think Ghoulish has had just had its one year anniversary as we're recording this. Yes. And to this day, you know, it's not every week, but at least once a month, I'll get, you know, a message from a fan or a reader who has come across that podcast <laughs> and takes it dead serious, doesn't understand that we were joking around. Do you get blowback? on that <laughs> or like any of the episodes uh nothing negative but i have no. been asked uh, many times if that was a bit or if i was serious and i always tell them no it was not a bit i uh tricked them <laughs> <laughs> well now they're gonna hear this and they're they're gonna know you lied to them so i'll, I'll play along max did in fact trick me and uh I tricked him. It, it turns out this is not going to air on the hard show, Brian. <laughs> this, you just seem lonely and wanting to talk to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So you're you're in Indiana. You're you know you're you're taking care of your own education. You're reading. Um, I suspect the multi-genre stuff was always there for you, even as a kid. So what? Like, what were your early influences? What were the things that that really struck you as a kid growing up? Yeah, uh, Vonnegut, definitely. Uh, Christopher Mill was a big influence. I mean, his yeah. book's all hilarious. Uh, I was a big fan of David Wong and all the stuff he was writing at Cracked as well, because yeah. a lot of my time was spent reading the stuff that was on Cracked.com when I was right. a teenager, because I am a baby. Uh, a lot of movies as well. I, I just we were a big movie family growing up. Always um, in the house we lived in before moving to a hotel, we uh, <laughs> we had a we all lived in the living room because every other house was so messy you couldn't walk into. Right, and so we would just always have a movie playing even at night. And I don't know. I just watched a ton of movies, especially movies I probably shouldn't have watched at like six and seven. Like a, a favorite movie I would watch all the time with my mom was True Romance. So Quentin at Tiltino. Six or seven. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was no <laughs> uh, limits. <laughs> 
the funniest I, the funniest like limit I can think of is like nudity was a big no go. So I would have to just put my hand in front of my face. Right. So for the longest time, I had no idea what happened in the second half of From Dust Till Dawn. I had no idea Vampires <laughs> was involved. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, you know it's it's ironic, or maybe it's not. Um, I mean, you know, you lived in a hotel your teenage years, and as an adult, I don't know if we can talk about this on the air or not. But you you work overnight shifts in a hotel. I do. I um, have. Yeah, I have, go ahead. I have a strange history with hotels. So to begin with, before I was uh, alive, before I was shot out of my dad's penis into my muzzle. Uh, Is that my, how <laughs> that's what I'm told. I haven't uh, seen proof. But my uh, my dad owned a hotel with some friends. And that's how he met my mom, because she came in with the uh, then f- f- uh, fiance. And my dad was like, hey, you want to go to the Bahamas with me? And she said, no, creep and left. But then she came back <laughs> and applied for a job. And uh, she got the job. And, you know, they probably began fucking at one point. And the hotel went uh, went uh, bankrupt and they uh, got married and had me and. Eventually, the, the we moved into a hotel until I was uh, 16, and we got a house. I, I moved out when I was 18 and came to Texas, and yeah, then I got a job at a hotel. So it's like, I'm just, uh, I'm a magnet to hotels, or maybe a hotel is a magnet to me. Either way, we all inseparable. <laughs> well, you know, I think back, uh, your novel, The Nightly Disease, that's one of the first things I read by you. Um mm-hmm. You know, it 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 obviously in talking to you, it draws a lot from that experience. Would you say that it's probably your most autobiographical work to date? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, many of the scenes in The Nightly Disease were written uh, on the job after just experiencing the absolute rules of humanity and needing some way to uh, relieve that stress. So a lot of the scenes are uh, true, but hidden by fiction. Yeah. Now, are your mom and dad still around? Yeah. Yeah. Back in Indiana. Do you, I mean, you're, you're still on good terms with them or. We uh, began getting a long mill once I moved out. So yeah, we've, uh, yeah. we're pretty okay at the moment. So what do they think of, of like, what you've done, what you've become, you know, from from growing up in that situation. I mean, you know, you've got your own your own small press. Uh, you're starting to you're really starting to take off as a writer, particularly here this last year. I mean, you know, do you ever talk to them? Do they ever say anything about it about it all? Yeah, they uh, feel pr- I feel pretty proud of the writing stuff. I think they will baffled and confused about what the uh the small press i run is i don't yeah. think they quite understand that and <laughs> i don't think have it's an actual to machine. explain it <laughs> i i just don't think they understand what it is or what i do <laughs> well I, you know i want to talk about that um yeah now you're good friends with michael david wilson we had him on a couple weeks ago mm-hmm. um and i posed a similar question to him be, because both of you uh really strike me when it comes to this you know as i said you're still working a day job or technically a night job um you're writing books stories and articles regularly i mean regularly you know you're running a small press you're editing a magazine um you know you're editing the occasional anthology so how do you juggle it you know like serious answer what is max booth's secret to time management god so like the honest answer is i don't do it well and i'm constantly freaking out and having a uh, anxiety attacks because i have too many things going on at once and i have a i have i have no system of organizing anything but i i constantly take on new projects and they just keep stacking up and stacking up and i just pace around uh scratching my head going oh no oh no oh no <laughs> that's the, you know that's the most honest answer i can think of <laughs> i i think I think I brought this up when Michael was on. I can't remember, but, you know, I, I think all writers do that early on because, you know, you're, you desperately want the work, you want the gig. So if somebody offers you, offers you something, you say yes. Um, and it's always nice to know that you got another paycheck coming. 
Uh, but Norman Partridge, a, a couple of years ago, he I was on the phone and I was complaining about that very thing to him. I, I was like, you know, I keep taking on more projects and I just can't juggle it all. And he said, do you have a pen and paper? And I, I said, yeah. And he goes, actually, get yourself a marker. And I'm like, OK. He goes, all right, write this down. I go, OK. And oh, <laughs> and he goes, now hang that above your desk. And anytime somebody offers you something new, say that until you've got room for it on your schedule and i started doing that and it's it sounds so simple but it's hard to do max because yeah, you know yeah. you're you're worried you say no and then you won't get another offer <laughs> it, it would be funny if uh you uh you looked like into a mill and saw the reflection of no and it just said on and you were like what the fuck does that mean <laughs> <laughs> do you i mean you know your night job I think of Edward Lee, you know, Edward Lee's very last day job. Uh, he was a security guard overnight and and he would sit there. He, he wrote many of his first novels, his first published novels during that job. Are you in a similar situation? Like, are you able to sit and write at night or can you not answer that because your employer might hear it? Up here? I don't give a shit about what they think. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes it's the, it's the answer. Uh, but then the last two or three yields the hotel is a uh, boomed and it's gotten so busy i don't have a lot of time to do anything especially within the last uh three months or however long this pandemic has been going on because uh we let go of uh, a lot of the staff and most of those duties have now fallen on me so i'm constantly uh doing laundry it seems wow and you would you would think a business like that would slow down during this time, but I, I guess not. It dropped a lot, which is why we had to let go of the staff, but the laundry never ends, Brian. Right. Laundry does not end. So we'll, so we'll see that showing up in a novel or a story at some point. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I've been posting photos every night of how much the laundry has grown on social media, and it's beginning to be like that fucking uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchels movie. But like, it's that long uh, uh, monologue about how things multiply. That's right. what I'm that's thinking about every night when I go in. <laughs> so do you, I mean, I know you said that, you know, you, you don't have any sort of schedule, but like, do you, do you make sure you write every day or, or some days are you writing and some days you devote to publishing and, or is it just, you do a little bit of everything every day? So, what I would like to do, and this does not happen often, is dedicate throughout the week one day to one specific uh, thing. So one day should be fiction writing, one day should be nonfiction writing, one day should be podcasting, and so on. Doesn't happen like I want it to, so it's it's more of a chaotic uh, rush to just get a bunch of things in at once. I uh, do not write every day because I uh, just have too many projects going on, and I don't feel the need to write every day. I know the uh, I know realistically maybe I should. I know the whole you know you have to go and sit down at the desk and write because it's a job, and I do believe that, but I just I'm lazy, Brian. Yeah, but Max, I got to tell you, I'm you're you're faking it well um, because it, I'm I'm honestly surprised to hear you don't write every day because you're you're prolific as hell. Um, you know, you're you're regularly putting stuff out, which is what any working writer needs to be doing. Um, so the fact that you're not writing every day is actually pretty impressive. All right, I'm glad to have uh, <laughs> pranked you. <laughs> Bastard, you prank me again. <laughs> All right. Um, so we we got to veer into an uncomfortable area. But uh, last week's show, of course, we we talked at length about the situation with Cinestate. Uh, this week's show, you haven't heard it because we were talking about it before we brought you on the air with us. Uh, but we've talking we've been talking more about Cinestate specifically in regards to Fangoria. Um, now, your novel, Carnivorous Lunar Activities, which is, by the way, readers, it's a fantastic book. You've heard me rave about it on the show before. I'm going to rave about it now while Max can hear me raving about it. Um, you know, but that was that was published by Cinestate. Um, You also occasionally freelance for Fangoria. Um, do you can you talk about how 
this news and all these allegations have impacted you in, in that regard? Yeah, um, not great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I gotta, I gotta be honest. When, when, when the allegations first started coming out, you know, I, I, I did what we always do. We, we research and we research and we research and we get people to go on record. Um, and, and particularly in this case, um, because I was still in the process of doing that when the Daily Beast and others went ahead and broke the story. It's like, all right, well, they've got people on record. We can report on their reportage. But uh, one of the first things I thought of throughout all this, honestly, w- was your book, um, you know, because it it is up for a Splatterpunk Award. And I'm old and jaded, but I still remember what it's like to get nominated for something like that. It's fucking great. You know, and my first thought was, well, geez, I hope this this doesn't taint that for Max. So, yeah, I mean, talk talk about if you can. I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't want to get you in trouble. I'll talk. All right. talk. How has this impacted you, Max Booth? So I don't want to. um, I'm hesitant to uh, play like a victim called or anything, because obviously the real victims involved who will really victimized and exactly i'm really uh glad that they spoke up that was a really courageous thing to do so thank you for speaking up and it's fucked up that something like this is still happening it it's really frustrating that we can't just create cool shit without scumbags getting in the way and ruining everything right uh, i I've had a lot of experience with bad small presses. I mean, you read one of my statements on the podcast when the uh, Donk Fuse blew up. Uh, yep. They they had just released my novel, and then everything happened. And I've had other experiences with presses that have till now to be shady, almost directly after publishing me. <laughs> I do admit sometimes it feels like I'm fucking cool, which is a an amusing thought, maybe only to me. That's why you're one of the Brian Keens of your generation. I, I used to have the death touch too. A small press would publish me and then they'd implode. <laughs> I'm going to begin including that when I submit books to places. Hey, <laughs> I have the death touch. Publish me. <laughs> uh yeah, I I hope the book wins. Obviously, I have a Neville uh, one and a rule to be full, so that would be pretty cool. Plus, I I know what the uh, trophy looks like, and it's the coolest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. So yeah, that's great. I, I just want I just want it so I can touch it and look at it a lot. I at the moment I do not recommend anybody uh, spend money on the book. I don't want any money going to Cinestate at the moment. Right. So I mean. If you do want to read it, it's a little ways online that you probably can without spending money. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> I laugh, but, you know, I, I'm laughing because I can very much remember JF Gonzalez and Mary and Brian Smith and myself doing the same thing with our leisure books titles. Um, you know, we, we didn't want people giving money to leisure and, and we encouraged them to find other ways to read our books. Uh, yeah. The more things change, the more they stay the same, I think. Um, you know, again, I I don't want you to say things that you shouldn't be saying on the air. But, you know, do you think there's a possibility you, you might be able to get the rights back from Cinestate and bring out a different edition? I would say that it seems like a good idea. Okay. I don't know what else I can say about that at the moment, but I yeah, think, yeah, I Brian, that's, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about the new books that, that people can buy. Um, you've got two new books out right now. Touch the night is available mm-hmm. from cemetery dance. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's got to feel good, right? Your very first cemetery dance release. My God, that was insane. I uh, did not expect that to happen. When I first began writing that, just getting something in the magazine seemed like an impossible task. Also, I have not gotten anything in the magazine, so it still feels like an impossible task. But <laughs> to get a book out with them, holy shit, yeah, that's insane. I It was a thought that never even crossed my mind that might happen. Yeah. Well, the ebook is on sale right now. Uh, the hardcover, and I actually did my due diligence before we had you on the air. I I asked, 
and I found out the hardcover. It's on its way back to the warehouse from the printer. So it should be shipping any time now. Um, now, this is unabashedly a horror novel. Yes, but it is uh, pretty fucked up, Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I haven't read it yet, but um, you know, obviously, I know everyone at Cemetery Dance. I've I've heard it's really fucked up. Uh, one of the main plot points is police corruption. So you know, that's a timely release. Um, talk a little bit about the genesis for the book. Yeah, so I think every book is inspired by one uh, seed, one idea. And if that's true, then Touch the Night, it came about from uh, when I was uh, 11 or 12, and I was spending the night at my uh, my friend's house, and we decided, hey, we all kids, why don't we asleep? Let's go outside. So we so we snuck outside like a, a past midnight at who knows what time. What are you, a cop? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and we uh, went around doing some uh, petty property damage and doing dumb things that kids do. Right. And on the way on the way back, a uh, a cop came up behind us and basically was uh, they they got out of the vehicle and began giving a shit about being outside past midnight because I guess. When the sun's down, only vampires can be outside. And they began, uh, you know, yelling at us, unprompted, calling us many uh, homophobic uh, slulls. And at one point, they slammed my head down against a fucking cop call hood and handcuffed me, despite not doing anything. <laughs> and yeah, it was just a big fucking unprompted bout of uh brutality i would say i i would say it it was no real nil as a uh significant as other cases of brutality but i don't know what the fuck else to call this right and, uh, one kind of funny thing is we were right in front of my friend's house when they came up <laughs> and my friend said oh yeah i'm i'm his brethren pointing to me and then he gave my address Oh my which, god! Which was really awkward when his mom walked out and said, "What's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> did, uh, you, did you find you know? I mean, that happened at a young age. Did you find you had a distrust of law enforcement from then on out? Absolutely. I mean, I would say I kind of had like I don't know what would be the right rule choice but by then i was listening to a lot of punk rock music so right. in my head i was like yeah fuck cops but really i had no like cause to say why just right. just the music i liked but yeah uh that moment would uh, implanted a deep distrust of authority and it uh, has not gone away since so with touch the night the book begins almost exactly the same way even some of the same dialogue, like one of the kid lies, one of the kids lie about uh, <laughs> being his brother, uh, except in Touch the Night, the mom does not come outside and the cops take the kids away, but they don't right. take them to a police station. They take them someplace else because maybe these cops are not as human as the kids initially thought. Right. And then the the moms get involved. The local sheriff refuses to do anything. He doesn't think the kids are missing and the moms right. have to find them themselves. Right. Um, now, what I've been told, again, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I've been told there's a lot less humor in this one. Um, yeah, um, not as not a lot of comedy, although I would say uh Still some comedy, still some comedy in it. I mean, most of my humor comes from the way that kill tools interact with each other. I don't write a lot of uh, wacky situations, right? But I do write a uh, funny dialogue and still some cases of it, although not as much as some of, as some of my previous books. I wanted to write something really uh, fucking raw, I would say, and I hope that's what I did. It sounds like that's what you did. Um, and I would say that applies to the other new book. We need to do something. <laughs> you, you know, you said everything starts with a seed. Uh, this one, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you had a, a tornado warning in your home there in Texas. Uh, and your family took shelter in the bathroom to wait out the storm. Um, and, you know, you uh, <laughs> while you were in that situation, 
you kept thinking to yourself, well, what would happen if we got trapped in here? What what would we do? What's the story? And then you wanted to see if you could write an entire book set in a bathroom. Yeah, I think what made me decide that it was a good idea was I kept asking it out loud as we were waiting. I was like, hey, what would happen if we got stuck in here? And they kept saying, shut up. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is a good idea. <laughs> what's, even, no. what's even funny is uh, last week, I think, we had another little tornado rolling. We had to go into the bathroom and wait it out. And uh, so most uh, my wife and also uh, my uh, stepkid, they both have read the book. My stepkid's uh, 11, which is right. – funny that he would read the book he actually uh looked over my uh my back as i was reading the whole time because he is fascinated by tornadoes and once he found out i was writing about tornadoes he had to be involved right so as we're waiting in the bathroom <laughs> they begin talking about the book and the uh my stepson keeps going oh my god i hope a Oh, I'm not going to say what happens in the book, but he brings up a plot, a subplot from the book, and uh, <laughs> his sister, who has no idea about the book, begins uh, freaking out. She's like, "What are you talking about? Why would that happen?" <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've you've said online you think you think we need to do something is the darkest thing you've ever written. Absolutely. Uh, you, you said, "quote It did not make me feel good to write, and I don't imagine it will make you feel good to read." Um, you know, you said went on to say there's some humor present, but not as much as readers expect in your fiction. Um, writing that back to back with Touch the Night, do you, do you think your prose and your muse are starting to move in a, a, a darker direction? After writing both of those back to back, I felt so exhausted and drained. I don't know when the next time is that I will write something of that extreme genre again it was uh it it took something out of me i think man especially we need to do something it's only a novella but oh, fucking hell that was a tough one to write just because of some of the the content that happens and i've uh since then had to read and rewrite it many times including uh i've gone through probably about fucking 15 drafts of a screenplay at this point so it's like in uh the godfather 3 every time i think i'm out they fucking drag me back into this goddamn thing <laughs> <laughs> so what are what are you working on now other than the screenplay like do you have a palate cleanser do you sit down and, i don't know write a story about butterflies or something i'm writing this uh the strange shaggy dog detective novel that takes place in 1955 in Los Alamos. So it's kind of yeah. different. It's uh <laughs> it's, it's really different actually. It's a, uh, <laughs> it's about the atomic bomb and stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's night and day different. <laughs> <laughs> it's the complete All right. opposite. All right. Well, Max, man, it is, it is good to talk to you, brother. Um, I, you know, I had hoped, that we would be doing this in person in August at KillerCon. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Skype exists and that we got to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't bring myself to prank you. I know, I know you've been wanting to be on the show. I've been wanting to have you on the show for like the last two years. I'm glad we finally got to do it. Uh, folks, follow Max if you don't on Twitter. He is Give Me Your Teeth. Give Me Your Teeth. Uh, or, of course, you can go to his website, Tales from the booth.com um, anywhere else they should look for you or are those the, the two preferred choices that's the only places you can find me you can come to texas and look for me but uh, i do not exist so <laughs> all right touch the night uh available right now an ebook and hardcover on the way from cemetery dance and we need to do something uh available uh in both paperback and ebook as well correct Yes, and also Touch the Night is coming out in paperback the same time as uh, the Cemetery Dance Editions. I'm uh, self-releasing the paperback myself. Perfect. All right, great. All right, Max Booth, everybody. Max, thanks a lot, brother. Thank you. Okay, and we're back. So there you have it. Great interview with Max. Uh, very happy to have finally had him on the show. And, uh, of course, his comments about the whole Cinestate thing and, and, you know, his book, with them uh, very timely. Um, I, I hope Max doesn't think that that's the only reason I brought him on the show. <laughs> no, I, I, don't think, I don't think he does. My original plan was to interview him at KillerCon in mm -hmm. August, you know, in person. 
Um, and then I saw that, you know, his cemetery dance book was, was dropping this week. And I thought, well, you know, now's a good time to have him on. Then the whole Fangoria Sinistate thing broke loose and, and Max can confirm. Like I told him several days later, Hey, by the way, right. We're going to have to ask you about this heads right. up. So anyway, there we have it. Uh, Matt, Dave, anything you have before we, we end the show? Um, I just want to say that when I'm up there, see you guys for the first time uh, since January, um, you know, I, I do need to get the digital recorder back because uh, I think we have a new segment for the show. It's called Phoebe yells at the, at the television. Um, oh, well, there you go. Um, because uh, we watch things and then she yells. It, it's very entertaining. We watched the uh, movie Uncut Gems the other night, which neither of us liked, but she had an extreme reaction to it and uh I, i'm like i, I, I really just, liked uncut gems i i figured it's more your kind of movie than ours i think is honestly because I'm, i was watching i'm thinking i'm not into this but i knew brian Keane loves this so i was absolutely I, right you know i'm not the world's biggest adam sandler fan I'm, I'm sure he's a nice person uh it's just his his stuff never really appealed to me i i liked the wedding singer but that's yeah. about it. This uh, is more serious yeah but i loved uncut gems particularly the ending which i won't spoil um I, I just it it wasn't for me um and uh but anyway i i i'm like oh i wish i had the digital recorder right now because her rant was legendary still not as good as the one she had after we watched hereditary um <laughs> which we like the movie it, it, this is a slight spoiler for the film there's a sequence in the near the beginning of the movie it involves a food allergy yes and uh phoebe had feelings on that you know because she worked <laughs> at school and she dealt with food allergies um so that is still the greatest rain ever, which I'm like in the car. I'm like, I, I want to record this. So I, I need to get the recorder back um, to, to, to do that. So, um, you know, that'll be a new segment on the show. So well, there we go. Look for Matt, that. Matt, are you working on a new segment for the show as well? Or um, I, depending on what you decide to do with Fangoria, I might not be working for the show at all anymore. So <laughs> um I will reserve all of my ideas for other people at this point. Now, look, man, if, <laughs> if, if Nick Garris wants to join the Brian Keene radio network, I need you to engineer that. I just can't pay you to engineer. <laughs> I, I'd be delighted that I would. <laughs> all right. Well, if, Matt, if, you have that Lexmart printer. So while you're printing those DC comics, you get also print in Fangoria. Right. That's true. That's or true. if you would like Matt and Dave to make more money, there's an easy way to do that. Go to BrianKeen.com. At the top of the page, click podcast slash radio. Um, and all the information you need to advertise on the show is right there. Um, I will tell you this without, you know, releasing uh, business information. Uh, s- advertising slots for July and August, for some reason, are filling up very very fast. Uh, so if you have something timely, reach out and we'll see if we can make it work for you. Um, of course, Matt uh, yeah. had a whole bunch of books to sell at conventions this summer. That hasn't happened because there are no conventions this summer. At least there are no, uh, there are plenty of irresponsible right. conventions. There's no socially, socially yeah. Yeah. conventions yeah, but, this summer. But those, yeah. the conventions who are, are, are smart are, of course, are not having conventions. <laughs> so if you would like, this is a long way, convoluted way of saying, if you'd like to buy a book directly from Matt, uh, he'll sign it for you and send it to you. Reach out to him on social media. Uh, Mary and I, of course, you can buy our books on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, including the number one bestseller trigger warnings by Brian Keen. That's true. I hit number one on Tuesday. Very nice. Congratulations. Cool. Thanks everybody for making that happen. And, of course, Dave's GoFundMe. Uh, just go to GoFundMe.com and uh, type in Dave Thomas, and you'll you'll see it pop up. Um, next week, I think we're going to have Stephanie Watovich. Cool. Uh, in fact, I know for a fact we're going to have Stephanie Watovich. <laughs> okay. And uh, <laughs> the first thing I'm going to ask her is, have I been mispronouncing her name all these years? We'll find out. Listeners, you'll find out, too. We'll see you then. Bye. 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 For Sheriff Abigail Lane, life in Rockridge, Ohio, is cream cheese. Everyone keeps to themselves, 
And the last time the sleepy town needed serious policing, she hadn't even entered the academy yet. But when her boyfriend's son, Caleb Welsh, loses his head on County Road 10, her neat and orderly lifestyle is flipped wrong side up. All clues point to an animal attack, but what kind of animal has the ability to decapitate someone? One that is half human, of course. Even Lane's OCD won't help her in pursuing the worst threat Rockridge has ever seen in The Buck Stops Here, the new novella from Sean Seabock, available on Amazon on Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, and in paperback. All proceeds benefit the World Wildlife Fund. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is a production of the Brian Keene Radio Network. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. The Horror Show with Brian Keene is written by Brian Keene and produced by Brian Keene, Mary San Giovanni, Matt Wilderson, and Dave Thomas. Our theme music is by Matt Hayward. Our engineer is Matt Wilderson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. If you enjoyed this show, you might enjoy our other podcasts, Cosmic Shenanigans, Defenders Dialogue, and Grindcast. To advertise on The Horror Show with Brian Keene, visit BrianKeene.com and click Podcasts. <laughs>